Do you remember the saying, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's? There's one wonderful occasion in St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22, when they're trying to trap Jesus. Now, you're not afraid of anyone, are you? No. Well, tell us honestly, is it permissible to pay taxes to Caesar, to the Roman occupying government? If he says no, well then they report him to the Romans. If he says yes, well, of course, he's selling his own people down the river and his own religions. So he said, give me a coin. And looks at it and said, whose head is this? It's the coin they pay, use to pay the tax with. Caesar's. Because they, they know, he knows that, he's not really asking. Whose image? Whose name? Caesar's. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Well, I don't know what they made of the answer. But they hadn't caught him, and they didn't know how to go on after that. St. Augustine has a wonderful idea from this, which is not really anything to do with what the Gospel means at the time, but his image is this. And Jesus held the coin and said, Whose head is that? Whose name? One day, God the Father will hold me in his hand and look at me and say, Whose image is that? And I hope he'll look at me and say, That's the image of Jesus, my son. Of course, I might get blurred. Sometimes if you keep a, a coin for a long time, it does get blurred and it's not very clear. Or it gets covered with dirt and you can't really see it. And that could happen with me. So I hope I will have the image of Jesus. Look at me and say, that is Jesus. Not externally, obviously. I'm not more like Jesus because I've got a beard. Not in that sense. I wouldn't be more like Jesus if I was crucified. No, it's not like that. Something within me has become like Jesus, like Christ. And I hope when God sees me, he will see Christ. You know, when they talk about the imitation of Christ, there's a book called The Imitation of Christ, it's not imitation in the normal sense that we use it. No, because what I mean is, to imitate Christ, you say, well, read the gospel and do what he did and become like Christ. No, that's acting like Christ. Imitation is something happens within me, in my real self, that I become like Christ, deep within myself. In fact, I think perhaps a better image these days, instead of looking at a coin, we've got looked at a banknote and saw the watermark deep within it and says, there you are. Look deep within me and see Christ. That I have become like him. In the process, you don't lose your own personality. In fact, if you become like Christ, your personality will grow become more itself. Like a couple getting married, we have the ceremony here, I don't know if you do, in which when they've been married, immediately afterwards, there are two candles, two small, and each one takes the candle, which is already a light, and they together light the central candle, which is a bigger one. The image being, we came as two people, now we are one. But they don't blow their candles out. They keep their own personality. Uh, you must have come across this when you say, she's really blossomed since she met him. He's really grown and developed since he met her. Not becoming like her, or perhaps or she become like him, but more, 
that through each other their own personality grows and they become more themselves. In fact, St. Paul puts it in a prayer like this. Listen. Out of his infinite goodness, may God, through his Spirit, make your hidden self grow strong. Your real self grows strong so that Christ may live through faith in your heart. Not selfishness, but the real you, the real personality grows largely by not concentrating on yourself, but thinking of other people. If that happens, if I can forget myself and grow helping other people grow like Christ, then with, because I turn away from myself, my raw personality grows. Lovely image. God looking at me and saying, this is the image of my son Jesus. Please God, that will happen. But the real meaning of the passage in Scripture is Caesar or God. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's or to God the things that are God's. And so we separate them. Now what is Caesar's and what is God's? And that is misleading. One leads into the other. It's a bit like when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. He immediately adds, and the second commandment, they hadn't asked him for that, but he says it, the second commandment is like the first, love your neighbour as yourself. Now he puts those two commands together, because if you can love your neighbour, then you will love God. He hardly ever in the scriptures goes on about loving God. But very often our Lord is on about loving your neighbour, loving the people who are in need, loving those who are hurt. The whole point where he became human, when it's put in Isaiah, and Jesus quotes it about himself, to bring good news to the poor to bring comfort to the broken-hearted. Now, to love God, I need to love others, to love my neighbour. Love is not just words. I can say, oh my God, I love you, and get annoyed that somebody's interrupting me and go kicking in the teeth. No. If I love the others, so I may forget my prayer to go show my love of someone else, my generosity and my kindness, then I grow in the love of God. And so the same with render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. In giving back to Caesar, to the state, I am building up the kingdom of God. Of course, if it's a corrupt government, like it was in El Salvador a few years ago, and Archbishop Romero opposed it, put his life on the line and was killed. Yeah, But if a government is on the whole, the laws are just and right. No, it's never perfect. But if it, then I need to obey those laws. And in doing so, I'm building up the kingdom of God. In paying to Caesar, as they call it, paying my tax. Suppose if the man really prayerful, always coming to Mass, praying away, and manages to get out of paying any income tax by trickery. <laughs> He's not building the kingdom of God. He's tearing it down. We build the kingdom of God through things which are not particularly religious. In the Old Testament, one example like that was when the Jews were captured and taken off to Babylon, it, a bit like the Holocaust in the 20th century. It was almost the end. 
And then the third king, um, Cyrus the Great, a dictator, gave them permission to leave Babylon and go back to their own country. Not only that, he paid for the building of their temple. And interpreting that, they say, God was using Cyrus as his instrument. Cyrus didn't know that, he just did what he thought was right. Gandhi wasn't a Christian, but God used him to build up the kingdom of God. And when we get to heaven, a lot of people there who seem to have no religion and no religious idea. You know, once I was helping with Christian aid, what we did, we, we'd go round and put envelopes in all the doors and come back a few days later and hopefully they'd give the envelope back with some money in it. And I went to one house, as an Indian lady came, she clearly wasn't a, um, a Christian, I think a Hindu, and she called her three children, and they all came with their money boxes, and each one took, had to take something out of her money box and put it in the envelope. That woman building up the kingdom of God through her children. We build up the kingdom of God by con contributing, contributing to the state, to our community. And if we try to bypass that, then you're not building the kingdom of God. God again and again warned the Jews that people who were not Jewish were going to get into heaven before them. Because whether they realised it or not, they were building up the kingdom of God. They were obeying the great commandments of love. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, contribute to your community and to the country where you live, to the town where you are living, then you are giving back to God what is God's. God leads us, not just through what is religious, but God leads us through others. In giving to Caesar, do it in such a way that you give it to God. Allow the Lord to guide us. Look for the Lord in the ordinary things of your life. Where the sun awakens the day, where the road winds on its way, where the fields are sweet in hay, may we see the Lord. Where the leaves are gently rustling, where the marketplace is bustling, where rash our crowds are jostling, may we see the Lord. Where the stars shine in the sky, where the streets so peaceful lie, where darkness now is nigh, may we see the Lord. And in seeing the Lord, build up the kingdom of God by seeing God in other people. Amen.